and welcome to the Parker J. Cole Show. I am your host, the Queen Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. We are going to have a far out time today as I talk with my guest co-host and contributor, Dr. Tom Sheehan. He is the author of the book that we're going to be discussing called Ever Win. You may be wondering what in the world? Well, let me give you the full title. Every Win, God, Symmetry, and Time. And once you pick up your copy of this book, he is going to bring very complex things and make them simple for you. And if I can read this book without any problems, I know for sure you can too, because he's going to give us an opportunity to think about God in a non-traditional or non-conventional way. How does that relate to our discussion? We'll talk about that in just a few moments. As always, I want to thank you all for your support. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we covet your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net. Click that pink follow button and you'll never, ever have to miss a show. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest co-host and contributor today, Dr. Sheehan. Dr. Sheehan, how you doing? Just very well, Parker. I'm happy to be your guest today. And I am so glad that you took time out of your busy schedule to be here with me today. Really enjoyed having you and I'm looking forward to the conversation. What I'm going to do really quickly is read the bio for you because you are a very smart man and I love having smart people all around me. So Dr. Sheehan earned a bachelor's of science and PhD degree in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. During his 45-year career as a research physicist, predominantly in energy sciences, he worked for Bell Telephone Laboratories, the National Bureau of Standards, various research corporations, the U.S. Department of Energy, Argonne National Laboratory, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He was chosen as a Congressional Research Fellow by the American Physical Society, dealing with energy-related national legislation. Dr. Sheehan wrote the textbook, Introduction to High Temperature Superconductivity. Dr. Sheehan, a lifelong Catholic, is Director Emeritus at the Institute for the Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, ITES, which focuses on demonstrating the compatibility of faith and science as path toward knowledge. And I definitely want to start there, Dr. Sheehan, because you say you want to demonstrate the compatibility of faith and science as paths toward knowledge. I think this is really one of the fundamental themes that surrounds your book, Every Win. And to begin that, we have to ask the question, are science and religion opposed? What would you say to that, sir? Absolutely not. There was a wonderful statement made way back about the year 400 by St. Augustine, who said, the book of nature and the book of scripture were both written by the same author, and they will not be in conflict when properly read and understood. And that is an extremely valuable guidepost for everybody who is thinking carefully about both the world and about God and their relationship to God. This becomes extremely important, especially for me. Because I'm going to go through a Bible verse that is another running theme throughout your story. And it's 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And that's from 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Why is this a significant underpinning of your book here? Well, because of the fact that much of what I have to say in the book is to say that we humans are limited in our ability and we are looking at everything that we see in an imperfect way because of our limitations. The uh, looking through a glass darkly kind of referred to looking in the mirror and not seeing the whole story, but only a partial image of what the reality is. And that line by St. Paul, I think, was great insight on his part to understand the fact that we are limited and we don't know very much. But when we come face to face with God, then we shall know much better. And indeed, Paul says, even as I am known. So that is a terribly important line. And it's a real guideline for where I'm going with this book. 
I'm going to quote something about the cover of Every Win. And about the cover, you say this, the Hubble Space Telescope photographed the Veil Nebula, the remnants of a supernova about 2,100 light years away. The dramatic colors are indicative of the various ions radiating oxygen, nitrogen, etc. Trying to express our very imperfect understanding of God, St. Paul once said, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Just the verse we just quoted. Another form of impaired vision is through a veil, which gives a cloudy, blurry image. The many stars and galaxies behind the veil nebula remind us of how faulty our vision of God is. So now let's take it a step further. We now have the new telescope, James A. Webb. And scientists are just thrilled about the clarity of the images that are being sent back to us from a telescope a million miles away from Earth. How is that also a significant part of what you're talking about in your book, Every Wind? Well, we normally see as human beings in the visible range, and we know that dogs and some animals can see in the infrared. They see better at night than we do. The telescopes that we have had, such as the Hubble, which has been a magnificent accomplishment, see in the visible, and that's what we're used to looking at. But there's a lot of information out there in the infrared region, which is of a wavelength different from the visible, and that we cannot see with our ordinary eyes. And what it tells us is additional information, and that hints to us that when we're talking about God, trying to learn about God, we need to be open to the idea that additional information is there, but we have to look in a different way to see it. And the analogy between the infrared James Webb telescope and the Hubble and the visible is, I think, a very good one for the fact that our understanding is always limited and we're never going to get it perfect, but we can do better and better as we go along and try harder. In your book, I'm going to quote what you said. As a physicist, the appreciation I have for the symmetry and beauty of the laws of physics points toward the magnificent power of God. Many other scientists draw upon their own disciplines, biology, medicine, engineering, to appreciate what God has accomplished. Each individual is able to pursue his or her own distinctive pathway toward that goal of reconciling faith and science. Now here, we come to an interesting thought process here. Nowadays, it seems if you are a scientist, you automatically fall into a crowd that does not believe in God. But you've already said there is no division between faith and science. But how do you encourage that scientist out there who may be quiet about his faith because he can get serious repercussions from it? That is a problem for working scientists, and it does have a repressing effect on the expression of religious faith in life. But when we actually look at the things that matter most and start to wonder about what's really important, and we get away from just the atoms and the molecules, but into those higher human functions, which include things like love and friendship and loyalty and honesty and a whole bunch of factors like that, we have to understand that we're looking at life, looking at reality on a higher plane. And that's where I'm trying to encourage my readers to go, to get to that higher plane where they think at a level that is more than just science, just uh, atoms and molecules alone. And I'm happy to say that I have several colleagues from way back in college days who have spoken very favorably about what I wrote because it has helped them to understand how important it is that there's much more to life than merely science and that science is is compatible with all those realities that fill out the remainder of our life and make life important. You go on in your book and say this, at its foundational level, the laws of physics, science, is based on symmetry principles created by God. Let's talk about this for a second. What do we mean by symmetry principles? Okay, I, my contention is that God didn't particularly have to think up the laws specifically, he thought up the symmetry principles and those gave us the laws. So that's one step back a little bit from what people normally learn about. You go to high school physics and you learn about the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum. Those are laws of physics. But it's a while later when you learn that those come from a symmetry principle. And here I'm talking about something that's really in the back pages of quantum mechanics books. But it is the case that because there is a symmetry to the motion of time, that is to say, it shouldn't matter whether you're on Eastern time or Central time or Pacific time, your experiment should come out the same. 
there is this condition known as the conservation of energy. And if you also observe that it shouldn't matter whether you're in Phoenix or Toronto or Omaha or Houston, the experiment's supposed to come out the same. That is a symmetry principle of space, and that leads to the conservation of momentum. So the relationship between the symmetry principles and the laws of physics are, in my mind, just absolutely beautiful. And it just screams at me that this could only have been achieved by the infinite smartness, the power, the cleverness, the originality of God. Now, in your book, which is a major component, you talk a lot about time. Even the book itself is titled Every When. And I know some of our listeners may get tripped up by the whole idea. What do you mean by every when? And so here you say a major obstacle stands in the way. Talking about time. We humans have a very limited perception of time, which affects our understanding of God's comprehension of time, the quality of omnipresence. And then you go on further and say, when asked what omnipresence is, most people would reply, God is everywhere. But it also means that God is every when that is present to all time. Go ahead and just break it down for us a little bit here. Well, the reason I picked every when as the title is because it is a word that you haven't seen. It's a word that doesn't exist, whether it be in English, Chinese, French, or any other language, because people don't have the concept of every when. We're just, it boggles the mind. Yeah, you can talk about everywhere and people are comfortable with that. But every when, people are, what, what can that possibly mean? Well, I say that it means that we humans are limited and we don't understand time in the way that God understands it. Now, am I going to tell you how God understands time? No, because I'm just a human. I can't do it either. But I can recognize that this is a limitation of human beings, a, uh, a deficiency, a flaw. And when you have that and you recognize it, the answer is you got to be humble before God. You got to be deferential. You have to remember that God is smarter than us. And that's a core theme throughout my book. If you allow me, Dr. Sheehan, let me go to pop culture real quickly. I was thinking of a movie when I read this part of your book called Arrival. And there were these aliens that had perceptions of time that was more of an Eastern based philosophy, whereas they saw time in a circle as opposed to, quote unquote, the Western view, which is a point in time from one point going in a straight line. They saw time in a circle. And I was thinking about this because in a sense, would you perhaps say there's some idea about that? We were trying to conceptualize this every win instead of it being a point going forward it's a circle well the eastern religions are known for the idea that there's a cyclicality in life and in time and so forth the western mentality basically is that time always that was there and it just goes in one direction and there's nothing you can do about it and that's all there is to it well physicists of the 21st century have shown that time wasn't always there our universe or any other universe you can think of had to have a beginning. And that's a real accomplishment of 20th century people, even though back in the 1920s, George Lemaitre guessed at solving Einstein's equation, and he took the uh, hypothesis, the guess, that there was a beginning and a singularity. So we've had that knowledge for much of a, about a, a century now. But the idea that it had to have a beginning is relatively recent in the last 20 years. But it's a very important point that distinguishes one form of uh, time from another. However, what I'm talking about is God's ability to comprehend all time. It doesn't matter whether it's past, present, or future. He is simply present to time. And that's something that really people have a lot of time trouble getting their, their mind around because of the fact that our everyday experience tells us again and again that time just goes by and it's one dimensional. So I'm saying to people, look at this, live with it, understand it, but recognize that it's a limitation of you as a human being. And of course, you go on to say, do not assume that God is subject to the same limitations as people. And it may sound extremely simple, but you also say never underestimate God. And this becomes one of the bigger, I would say, linchpins of your book as you continue to read, because you really get deep down, I would say dirty into this topic here and lets us know just how far above God is and how it is a pleasure that he gives us an opportunity to understand some of what he's talking about, <laughs> just some of what he created. And I, I find that particularly invigorating. So my next question actually has to do, well, what we're going to do right now, Dr. Sheehan, I'm just going to quote something. I would love your thoughts about it. This is from a book written by a gentleman 
Fennel and they feel Weingart. And it says, he's greater than you know, that's the name of the book. And he says this, some theologians use God's foreignness to say we cannot understand God at all. Not me. We cannot understand completely, but we can understand what we need to understand. When I was three years old, I understood my father. What I understood of him was from a childish point of view, but it was not wrong. I only had a three-year-old vocabulary and experiences, but I experienced the real man. And so he talks more about this in his book. But I wanted to say, just listening to that short excerpt I read there, would you say that when we begin to think unconventionally about God, we begin to see new nuances of his nature? Absolutely right. Yeah, I love that line that he quoted because, you know, St. Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, spoke as a child, etc. But now that I'm a man, I have put aside childish ways. When we try to understand a little more each day, and frankly, reading the Bible is as good a way as any, probably the best way to enhance that understanding, then you're stepping up. You're getting a little closer to God. God offers us the chance every day to get a little closer. When St. Augustine said, a book of nature and book of scripture, same author, but they have to be read and understood properly, that's a tall order, but we can do it. We can move forward. We can get better at our knowledge of God. And we don't, any of us, pretend that we're going to get all the way there, but we can learn more. And that's doing a smart thing. That's doing a wise thing. That is a good use of your your thinking during your lifetime is to try every day to get a little better understanding. And when you're confronted with like personal tragedies, a loved one dies, somebody's terribly sick, things like that, there is a tremendous pull downward that tries to drag you back to the, the human level, the level of atoms and molecules, and prevents you, deterior, uh, discourages you from seeing it or trying to see it from the vantage point that God might have. And we all struggle with that issue every day, but it is the case that every day we can make progress if we work at it. I actually found this next section in your book rather profound. And there's so much in this book, Every Win, that I want our listeners to go ahead and pick up their copy of Every Win today. If you really enjoy digging deeper into how the sciences really show the character of God, this is one of the books that you definitely want to pick up. And so I want to talk about scientific materialism and how it is self-contradictory. And you say here, the domain of thought known as scientific materialism holds that nothing exists except material and all claims to knowledge other than scientific knowledge are faulty and unsustainable. Now, I want you to go into this. You do really go, you really dig into this, but let's go ahead and just give our listeners a preview of what they can expect as you tackle this argument. Well, first of all, I have to say that my tackling is inferior to that of many other theologians and, and hardworking people over the centuries. Cardinal Newman of the 19th century, Paul Tillich of the 20th century, Hans von Balthasar, and in the 21st century, a guy I regard as my personal friend, Father Robert Spitzer, have all espoused and explained this much better than I can. But what happens is that if you are trying to say all knowledge is uh, scientific knowledge, you will come to an impasse where you're self-contradictory. There's a, I suppose you'd call it a theorem in the field of logic and philosophy that the explanation of something cannot come from within the field itself, but has to come from without. And I don't think I said that correctly, but it's the general idea is that a system that is closed unto itself has to look elsewhere for its ex explanation as to why it exists. And the scientists who have tried to stay inside their own boundaries and never look outside have forgotten about or overlooked that point, is that the understanding is something that comes from outside the field of science. And a lot of scientists nowadays have recognized it because the leading question that scientists have and have no answer to is, why is there anything at all? You know, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a question that for centuries didn't occur to people. They just took it for granted that everything was there. But you can ask a question within the field of science, why is there anything at all? And the answer to that has to come from outside science. So using Spitzer's word incoherent is the description of the idea that science alone is the only form of knowledge. And then one of the biggest arguments that you make, which, again, I found just really invigorating, is that when we do a certain thing, we create a false God. Now, what is that false God? 
Well, any time you think that God is limited, it is probably because your image of God is limited. And the belief, the assumption that God has to behave according to time, just as we do, is, I call it a false God, because if God is subject to time, then there's something better than God that is superior to God. God is inferior to it, and that something is time. And to get beyond that, you have to recognize that God is able to comprehend all time. And I don't want to say at once, because that introduces time itself, but God's presence to time makes him better than time. He is the creator of time. It was St. Augustine in the year 400, you know, 1600 years ago, who said God created space and time together. And that's something that people forgot about for many centuries and always, always, always believed that the coordinate system, space and time, was just here, that it was just, it was. No, I say, and St. Augustine says, God is the creator of the coordinate system. God created space and time, and God is not subject to time. That is why I called time the falsest God of all, because people slip into it so easily, and it's so simple and normal to believe that time is immutable and time rules everything but it's not so. We did get a question from a longtime supporter. His name is Jeremy from Dolphin, Alabama. And Jeremy simply asked, were you inspired in any way by John 8, 58? And I'll just read it. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Jeremy, thank you for joining in the conversation. Dr. Sheehan? That's quite true, is that Jesus, as the Son of God and identical with God, consubstantial, has the existence unrelated to time prior to time. That's logically prior to time, not before time on a clock. But God has always been there. Time was something that came about at his decision. And Jesus, being part of God, is also there all that time. And he is the one person entitled to say, before Abraham came to be, I am. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is a discussion that I had recently. We were talking about on another show, Dr. Sheehan, the multiverse theory. And one of the articles I read from a website called Claremont Book Reviews actually quoted Dr. Stephen Meyer from the Discovery Institute. And in this book, the gentleman says this, Stephen Meyer in Return of the God Hypothesis, three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. The director of Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture argues that the science itself now compels us to consider the God Hypothesis, which as its name suggests, is the hypothesis that an agent characterized by transcendence, omnipotence, creative power, free will, and intelligence established the laws of physics, created the universe, and assembled the elements of life. Now here, I'm going to move down because there were going some some other uh, things here. All correct, by the way. Oh, yeah, for sure. But then he says this, and I would love to get your thoughts on here. He says, a leading cosmologist, Alexander Vilikin, has proposed that a process called quantum tunneling from superspace into a real universe could can produce space and time, matter and energy. But such tunneling must be governed by laws that are in existence even prior to the universe. He continues, the laws are expressed in the form of mathematical equations. If the medium of mathematics is the mind, does this mean that mind should predate the universe? And then the article says he never answers his own question. Why do you think scientists like Billiken and others won't answer this very, very interesting hypothesis here? That if the universe did come into existence, that a mind predates the universe. Well, that's Alexander Vilenkin is a brilliant physicist, and he was one of the people who, as I told you before, proved that a universe has to have a beginning. It's called Borde, Vilenkin, and Guth proof of that. That's about the year 2003, I think. So Vilenkin has still been around. Among other things, there was a celebrated event when Stephen Hawking turned 70 years old that a lot of important people came. And some lady who was a writer for Reuters or New York Times or something spoke of the worst birthday present ever in which the paper that Vilenkin delivered on that occasion proved that something Hawking had thought was wrong. So um, his name is quite revered in the hierarchy of uh, science. 
But I think what he's saying is that you come to a point where you just have to sit back and admire God. In Lonergan's book, he speaks of God being intelligibility, a pure intellect. And, you know, we run up and say, well, thanks, Mr. Lonergan, but tell us the details. And you can't because pure intelligibility, pure being, this goes back to, uh, I guess, beyond St. Thomas, way back to the early church fathers of second century, that pure being defies description. And over the centuries, it has become clear that God is love, and that's a very important characteristic or property. But as the centuries have gone by, we have never really been able to fill in the details very well. And when Vilenkin comes to a place where he can't answer his own question, that doesn't surprise me at all, because there are questions, the answers to which are beyond the grasp of human beings. I think one of the most interesting things was raised in about the year 1960, when a very famous scientist, clear back from the quantum mechanic days of the early 20s and 30s, named Eugene Wigner, wrote an article called about entitled The Unreasonable Efficiency of Mathematics, that mathematics really does lie at the heart of so many of these physical laws. Certainly, symmetry principles are, are a mathemat- form of mathematical principle. And for us physicists to see so much symmetry in the equations of, of physics and so forth is to admire the handiwork of God. We appreciate the beauty of those equations in a way that is tough for ordinary people to do. But if you studied science and got a lot of math in your background, it becomes stunning how magnificent these equations are and how it shows such a highly intelligent origin of them that you can only stand in awe of whoever it was that did that. And we as Christians say that we fall down, you know, I fall on my face before God, that This is an object of not just admiration, but of worship, because we humans could never come close to that level of thinking and creativity. And it brings to mind something I've said before, that God has given us his communicable attributes of creativity. And he also has given us the attribute of knowledge and learning more about the world around us. And what a great privilege it is to be able to probe the depths of the cosmos and see math and see a mind at work. And I think that's one of the bigger points that some scientists miss, that we have this knowledge, not just to have it, but it's for us to worship him even more. That's my theory in a way, Dr. Sheehan. And then, of course, I would love to end our show today with something you said here. The Nicene Creed contains an important commitment on the part of the Christian believer that God created more than just the world we see. How can you take that home for us as we end our show today? Well, God created, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and of all that is visible and invisible. The message there is that don't just look for the world in the visible. Don't just stop at the visible. Remember the invisible. There are things that we experience every day that are invisible, such as, um, again, love and thought and um, even music, uh, so forth, are invisible. You might say that a painting of artwork is in, is visible. However, the meaning of it is part of what's invisible. God created it all. And we, as human beings, limited as we are, can really benefit by recognizing those limitations, accepting them, and deferring to God's great superiority and brilliance. And that is something that I think, I hope I can bring out in the book, and I hope people will take that as an important message. What I really enjoyed about this book is that you are taking some high concepts and making it easy for us, the low man, (laughs) I'm just saying that jokingly, to understand. And as I was saying, if you want to read this book and delve deeper, this book really is for you, dear listener. So go ahead, love on my brother today and pick up your copy of Every When, God Symmetry and Time by Dr. Tom Sheehan. It's available on Amazon.com or wherever books are sold. Go ahead and get your copy today. Dr. Sheehan, thank you so much for being with us on the show. And I cannot wait to have you back and have you back real soon. Thank you very much, Parker. It's been a delight to be with you. And we were talking today to Dr. Tom Sheehan. He is the author of the book, Every Win, God, Symmetry and Time, available online wherever books are sold. What I definitely want to share with you is that if you love science, if you love probing into the depths of the universe, universe, but you want someone to hold your hand as you do that, Dr. Sheehan's book is going to do that for you because he doesn't just say it's all material. He's saying it is the product of the super intellect, the super intelligence. If you really are drawn to the intellectual, you really are drawn to the the data, 
this is the book for you. You want to prove that God exists? Look at what he created. We all know that if we see a piece of art, someone created it. What makes us think that the universe isn't that expression of art as well? Pick up your copy of Every Win, God, Symmetry, and Time by Dr. Sheehan. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of the Parker J. Cole Show. You have a wonderful, absolutely glorious blessed day. And God bless.